Hi, everyone. Um, so a uh, person who's commenting on uh, my articles and claims uh, doesn't like John 17, verse 3, and he was telling me that if I look carefully at this uh, a New Catholic Bible, relatively new, the New American Bible Revised Edition uh, issued by the Catholic Bible Press, that I would be told that they're claiming that the John 17, 3, the entire verse is an addition that uh, we can just dismiss as uh, inauthentic. But when you go here and you read it, uh, it's it's ambiguous enough that my friend might believe what he's thought it meant. But when you read it carefully and you look at the full context, you realize, no, that's not what it's saying. So I want to I want to share with you this note does not mean what my friend thought it meant. So or at least it's not clear. Uh, so the title of this uh, episode, it'll be relatively brief, is there's an ambiguous claim uh, by the recent Catholic Bible that John 17, 3, where Jesus prays, Father, the only true God, is an addition in the editing of the gospel as a reflection of the preceding verse. So that's what they claim, and I want you to see the note. The note in, uh, reads in its entirety, 17, 3, colon, this verse was clearly added in the editing of the gospel as a reflection on the preceding verse. Jesus nowhere else refers to himself as Jesus Christ. Okay, so... Just so, just so you know, it's true. Jesus never, never refers to himself as Jesus Christ anywhere else except here. So uh, that's even the Christianity today. Uh, so I think they're just making an observation that doesn't mean anything, and they're not questioning the ability of the verse based on that fact. This is the only time Jesus prays to the Father in front of others where it's being recorded. And so he might refer to himself as Jesus Christ to God the Father. Okay, so this all boils down to what does it mean when it says this verse was clearly added in the editing of the gospel as a reflection on the preceding verse? Now, I think we're going to find out why this doesn't mean what my friends jumped to the conclusion that this meant this was a fraudulent addition by a Trinitarian, which is, uh, no, excuse me, by an anti Trinitarian, which is preposterous. The Bible has been thoroughly been biased towards a Trinitarian, all kinds of uh, additions and changes uh, for over a thousand years have been making it more and more Trinitarian. And then finally, scholarship has come around to reverse that in the last few decades. So we now have newer Bibles don't have all these Trinitarian uh, readings that were, you know, mi medieval. <laughs> Let's put it that way, very late in the church history. So uh, I don't think any, any Catholic source Bible could ever <laughs> try to say that there was an anti-Trinitarian purpose uh, uh, at this point. What I think what they're saying in, in, in is a sensitivity to the text is um, that John, in his editing of the gospel, because he has to write it down or it has to be written down, and I'm going to talk about who wrote it just so we get a little bit more idea of at least Catholic scholars, no doubt, know that John didn't physically handwrite it. It was written by Papias, and we'll get to that in a second. So in the editing of the gospel, John's reading the prior verse, and he is then reflecting on it and remembering something else, and then adds the words in verse 3. So they're not claiming it's not authentically John's recollection or that it isn't something Jesus didn't say. And how do we know that? Because, let me just show you something. Here is how the Bible the New American Bible Revised Edition, N-A-B-R-E, appears on BibleGateway.com. And you can see verse 3 is there. There is only the footnote D, which then reads, as we, you know, here you go, uh, footnote D. And this is where the note reads, as I said, this verse was clearly added in the editing of the gospel as a reflection of the preceding verse. And that's all it's saying is whoever is editing it, John Papias is the other editor, it, in that process of reading the second the second verse, that person then adds the third verse. They, they think that's just obvious to them. I don't see it. I think it's speculation, by the way. And But more importantly, they did not believe this meant editing by a scribe, uh, excuse me, 
It's not an addition by a scribe. It's not an editing process. Uh, it's not a process other than the original editing by John is what they're talking about. It, they're not claiming a scribe added it because you would have used the words a scribe added it. That's how we would refer to a corruption. This is not a statement. This statement does not say it's a corruption. This verse was clearly added in the editing of the gospel as a reflection on the preceding verse. That is a statement about the editing process, not about a scribal edition. And the proof is in the pudding. They don't remove the entire verse. <laughs> so now let's look at what they're saying is in the editing process. John, Papias is the other editor, likely. There's two people working on it. We'll get into that in a second. Is when verse two had been done and they're still in the process of handwriting it out. It could have been just, you know, it wasn't like 20 minutes later or the next day. It could have been, you know, uh, John says to Papias, read back to me what I've told you so far and what you've got. And he reads it back. And in the editing process on reflection of verse two, now a third verse is added. Not that it's fraudulent by John. It's just one thing led him to think of another thing. So verse two says, just as you, so the prayer is father in verse one, the hour has come, give glory to your son so that your son may glorify you. Verse two, just as you ha gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to all you gave him. So now it's saying um, that God has, uh, God has given authority over all people so he may give eternal life to all you've gave, given him. So then somebody's thinking Jesus is, I've got to explain what I mean by eternal life. What do I mean by eternal life to God? And so it's added here. Now, here's the thing is, did, did Jesus have to tell God what eternal life was? No. So it's important that the apostles are listening to this. So this was meant for the apostles to think about Jesus and God to both know what we, he meant by eternal life. So this was said, I would even say Jesus is the one who is the one reflecting on it. And it's not edited later into it. It's Jesus is saying, I've just said the word eternal life. Now is the time for me to reflect upon what that means for purposes of John, who's listening to me, and he can remember it later. So, uh, but the way the Catholic editors or the Catholic, uh, Catholic translators and commentators, they're saying that the in the editing process, John or Papias or whoever adds this first now. In the memory is jogged to describe, oh, so Jesus stopped and then defined what is eternal life. And then he defines eternal life to be that uh, you should know the only true God and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. So it's not a corruption. It's not said to be a corruption. And it's still in the Bible. Now, if they had intended to be a corruption, we all know in the modern usage, when you want to indicate something is likely not an original, authentic text, you, you first of all, you have to prove it. You just don't, you, you would never say something like this, which is so weak. You have no authorities, you have no cross references, no proof of anything. But if you're just saying, hey, this is obviously edited as, a, as an addition during the editing process, it has no consequence. You're not saying there's any invalidity. There's no challenge to the validity of the text, which would require, you know, extra, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. They are offering no proof. They don't feel this statement has any extraordinary impact, and they don't act like there's any reason to remove it. So what I was getting to is if you believed or if they believed this text was fraudulent, They've got to do what we did with the uh, woman caught in adultery. So if you look at the NIV, you'll see it's boxed off. I think I think what's normally done nowadays when we think there's a fraudulent addition that somehow got in there and we don't want people to think it's a, a, a final view of the editors or the translators that this is authentic, we italicize the entire text and then put a footnote which is, you know, the footnote itself will be in raised italics. And then you go down to the italicized number or letter, and then you read it and it'll say this portion of text, this italicized portion of text from verses A to, you know, 15 or 16, whatever it is. This is called the adultery pericope, if I recollect, in, in John. And we we believe as the editors that this does not appear in the oldest codices 
and therefore is likely not authentic. So they're leaving it there for you to consider. But on the other hand, they're alerting you that they don't think it's, uh, they think, we think it's a scribal edition. So nothing like that appears here. There's no italicization. There's no uh, claim of scribal edition. There was only that the person writing this in their, uh, 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 how did they put it? In the editing of the gospel, which is something that a writer does. A writer and co-writer, Papias is the co-writer, will do that. So let's look at the role of Papias here so we can understand this This gospel did require editing because you had two people working on it, not just John. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so I want to read a portion of uh, something at Stack Exchange. So a lot of good uh, commentary comes out and good research is often on these Stack Exchange things. And one of those is about the Gospel of John and its writing. And they're going to reference a what's called a anti-Marcionite prologue to the book of John. So in the early church, there was an additional prologue put into John that describes the role of Papias in writing it. And this document is datable to the early one the 100s at least uh about uh you know 100s that th this claim was made and papius was alive in the 100s so let's read um this commentary and this was done about one year nine months ago and we're in 2022 so this is about in 2021 sometime a little bit earlier than that and it's titled was papius the scribe who wrote the gospel of john it was very common practice in antiquity for either for the author of a book or letter to use a scribe or amanuensis. Uh, and the use of the scribe is attested or implied by some New Testament documents. Um, for, uh, for example, Tertius and Romans, possibly Silas and First Peter. Uh, and then it's the we in John 21, 24. So there's two people speaking, we. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. So there's a reference to we. Well, what does it mean, we? I have no difficulty believing a well-traveled first century Galilean spoke Greek. So he says it's possible that John spoke Greek. But I suspect the services of a scribe would be of great benefit in set setting a full gospel down in writing. I am intrigued by a passage from the anti-Marcionite prologue to John. The Gospel of John was revealed and given to the churches by John while still in the body, just as Papias of Heropolis, the close disciple of John, related in the exoterics that is in the last five books. And so he wrote a book that has not survived. And so this prologue is actually referring and saying, you'll see Papias himself taking uh, revealing his role in the writing of the Gospel of John, if you go to that book. Now, that book has been lost to history, sadly. Uh, indeed, he wrote down the Gospel, Papias did, while John was dictating carefully. So they're working cooperatively together. So again, going back to these Catholic scholars, I think they're very, very, very well aware that John, John's prologue, the, the anti marcionite prologue exists. They know this gospel has substantial editing after the fact because you have two people writing it. One's dictating and the other person is handwriting it down. So there has to be a substantial editing process by John going back over and he may have forgotten to say something and then adds in things as he remembers them because I think inspiration isn't just like a, a ventrilo <laughs> ventriloquism where you can just Remember every single thing God brings back things to you uh, using your human memory, and and uh, that may have required substantial editing, and that's maybe exactly what the uh, Catholic scholar er, uh, editors did in their reference note to John seventeen verse three. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop there. I just want to read a little bit more from the commentary here because the gentleman makes a very good point. Uh, the prologue has been variously dated from the 2nd to the 4th century, so that means the 100s to the 300s. Uh, Papias lived in Aeropolis. Arrhenius tells us John resided in Ephesus a few days' journey away, so they're not far apart from each other, Aeropolis and Ephesus, until the times of Trajan. 
uh, well within the adult lifetime of Papias. So John in the lifetime of Papias is living in close proximity to Papias, a, 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 a few days journey apart from each other. Now, unfortunately, Eusebius says nothing about this. Given Eusebius' general dislike for Papias, I think he basically calls him uh, not a very intelligent man. That's what I, I'm being nice. <laughs> I think he was harsher than that. And his efforts to downplay Papias's possible association with John. So in other words, Eusebius might not want to tell people that uh, since he doesn't like Papias, he may not want to build them up by, by confirming Papias did have a close association with John. So he doesn't mention it. Uh, that is not all that surprising. And then this is what I think is important. Although Papias's writings are lost and we can't directly fact check the prologue, what intrigues me is that whoever wrote the prologue knew that the readers could fact check it and the prologue was still considered credible enough that it shows up in 10 different surviving manuscripts. So this prologue was repeated in other manuscripts. So other people believed it and they probably lived in an era when they could confirm what the prologue claimed that if you go to uh, Papias's uh, work, you could find the confirmation of what he's saying in his uh, the book Ex Exoterics. That really should be capitalized. You could see that's a book. So he had written something called the Exoterics, and he's saying, if you go there, Papias describes his role in assisting John in writing the gospel. So now I'm confident these scholars have that level of knowledge that the ordinary person doesn't know. There's a lot of editing that is admittedly going on between John and Papias, and I'm just going to add here again, the Gospel of John is written in very high, good quality Greek, while the book of Revelation is written as if it were a, uh, a Hebrew who had just learned Greek and was doing the best he could, with some help maybe, to write very rough Greek. So you have the book of Revelation is, is uh, very rough Greek, while the book of John, which is many years later in John's life, is written in very, very good Greek. And Papias is a, a native Greek speaker who apparently knows Hebrew. <laughs> you know, he can talk to a Hebrew, but he is a Greek speaker and he knows how to write Greek. And so that's why we see a gospel that's very, has a very different vibe than the book of Revelation. And so there's a little bit of the personality of Papias in there, but we, you know, I believe that Papias was being faithful. He was a very faithful Christian. He wasn't going to add anything in there as he's, as he's doing his work but he's going to make sure it sounds and reads very well. And he, you know, had to go back and forth with John. So I think that's all, that's all these commentators could, uh, are intending us to understand when we read uh, the, the paragraph we're looking at. So let's go back. So I want to show unquestionable proof that they did not remove John 17, three, as would be the case if they thought it was, I mean, certainly, was a, if it was certainly a corruption was what they meant to say instead of certainly a editing uh, uh, addition, something that was added during the editing of the, of the gospel, uh, which could be a reference to Papias and John working together. Certainly, that's at the time he would have been prompted by reading verse 2 to think about verse, what shows up as verse 3. They're not saying it's inauthentic. They're saying the process of reading and writing led to verse 3. Uh, and if they meant anything more, they would have to, they would have to, if they meant that addition is un, if un, inauthentic, they have to then tell, take it out. <laughs> and if they're that certain, they got to take it out and put a little footnote or put it in per, all italics and then say, you know, in, in bracket it and then say in a footnote, this is inauthentic scribal edition. And, and, but they're using terms that were ambiguous enough that my friend, had an, a thought that what they really meant is it was a textual corruption edition. That way it was an edition instead of a editing edition while you're writing something. So, but I want to show you here, uh, unquestionably, this is a Bible gateway. If, if you can see up here, it's the New American Bible revised edition, which is what we're looking at. We're seeing here, here's verse three. Now this is eternal life that they should know you, the only true God and the one whom you used uh, the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. 
Okay, and and the only comment they're making is this is the only time that Jesus refers to him as Je- himself as Jesus Christ. They're not saying to take that out; they're just making an observation. Apparently, that's correct. I've told you, Christianity Today said that G- Jesus never refers to himself as Jesus. They missed this one, so it must be true what the what the uh, the editors are saying is he never refers to himself as Jesus Christ anywhere else because he doesn't even refer to himself as Jesus anywhere else, and so apparently. Um, so that, that's all it means. It doesn't mean, it doesn't have any significance. It's just an observation they made and, uh, there's no intent to remove this verse because here it is. And if you click the little button under D, D will show you the footnote. This verse was clearly added in the editing of the gospel as a reflection on the preceding verse. So that's all it is. Somebody is editing it, John or Papias. And then Papia says, hey, John, did Jesus say anything else? So in reflection, John says, you know, he did. He said the following. This is eternal life that they should know you, the only true God. Okay, so um, I'm going to pause it there. And the only way we could have a question about uh, John 17, verse 3, is if there had been no idea, no concept that monotheism is true and that the Father is the only true God and that this uh, idea is being added into John 17, 3 in a radical way that you can just, you can tell it it doesn't match its time period. You can tell that with Trinitarianism because that did not become a doctrine. You know, you, we didn't even have the Holy Spirit, by the way, as being God until 381 AD, that nobody even thought of that at Nicaea. And the uh, the suggestion at Nicaea was uh, that Jesus was either uh, the first begotten son, Arius' idea, uh, uh, but or was he God? Okay, but this this took t- centuries to work itself to that crisis point, and then the, you know you ended up having Constantine make the decision, the final decision there, that Jesus was of the same substance of the Father, and that made him God, and that therefore. You could then twist uh, John seventeen three to mean that Jesus is God, just to show you what happened there. But what we can see is earlier in time, what Jesus says in John seventeen three comports with something that was said thirty years earlier by Paul in First Corinthians. So this is around fifty A.D. So John's writing about ninety six A.D. So we're talking about forty six years later. John is saying, Jesus is being recorded saying something that's already circulating in the church, the same words. So uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 4, Paul says, an idol is nothing, and we know that there is none other God but one. So a very monotheistic statement. And in verse 6, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Master, Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean he's God. there's one God. Who has who includes Jesus? No, the word master is is well understood. The word kyrios generally uh, should be translated as master, you know. But of course, it's always translated as Lord, uh, and um, but it does not signify. Most meanings don't mean God. So when I if I were to greet someone in the street, I'd say, "Hello, sir. How are you? Can I have the time of day?" I would call him kyrios. And that's the word for Lord. And that's what we trans- it's translated as Lord, but, you know, it's just a word of respect. And so there's one master, one sir, one dignified person, one uh, important person, you know, that kind of thing, one, one leader. And so if Jesus is our sole teacher, our sole pastor, he can be called our sole master as well. Anyway, but the point is, this is not a strange concept that's in 17.3 in John, that there is one God, the Father. Paul says the same thing 30, 40 years later. So it's, and it's a monotheistic country. The religion is monotheistic. The epistle of uh, the gospel of Mark has Jesus saying the most important commandment is that in John, as Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, that guy, it says, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Yahweh, you know, Yahweh is one. So you can't imagine, frankly, that Jesus would say anything but that there's one God, the Father. And if it had said anything else, 
if it was Trinitarian in, in the way it read, that you would have said, this doesn't fit the that epic. They had no idea that the Trinity was coming. That's going to be something that will be created two, 200, 300 years from now. And, and so you would only expect to see what you're seeing on the page of 17.3. So there's no way the 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 scholars i mean they're they're intelligent people they're they can't possibly have believed that this prayer was a corruption because there's nothing it comports with everything of that era of, of the time the way people talked the way people wrote it just doesn't make sense to think that that wasn't true so um and so I believe these men are intelligent enough to know that. And they also were referring to the writing process, the editing. And they probably knew the book of John had this special editing history to it that would involve two people working together, Papias and John. And so there's going to be moments of reflection that you might not think about if you were thinking it's, um, uh, let's say, Matthew writing his gospel or Mark there may not be any you know significant editing process there but here with this gospel you have two people who are collaborating frankly on the output and papius has to do a lot of talking with john to get the whole thing done and um so anyway i think that answers the question so my friend was reading it a text that uh, i believe i don't want to say he misread it the these writers could have been a little more clear <laughs> that, you know, uh, I mean, I would have probably written it. This verse was clearly added by John or Papias or by the, ed you know, in, in the the uh, gospel writer, maybe put it that way, the gospel writer or his eminusis uh, in the editing of the gospel. Just so you wouldn't re have people jump to the conclusion that you're claiming that there's somebody could have been other than John or Papias who were involved in adding something that wasn't there originally and then we would like to know why are you saying it's inauthentic so you get all those controversies those controversies but anyway they they left it in so they didn't think this was a corruption they thought this was exactly the way it was intended to be by john at the time so anyway i'm just gonna have to let my friend know in further in further reflection on this there is absolutely no critique here of the uh, gospel the authenticity of john 17 verse 3. Okay, God bless everybody. Take care. Ciao. Bye.